members of the team in Teams, and once you get logged in, um, we will be monitoring that team space until Christmas. Um, so if questions pop up during the semester, we will be able to respond to you in Teams very quickly. So just keep that in mind that you're going to get a lot of information this week, and I understand you can't absorb it all instantaneously, and that's okay. We will be here to answer questions as they come up. Um, if you do have a question and you can't use chat and you want us to, to answer it, you can use the hand raise function. I'm muting you, Austin, because I can hear myself echoing in your house. Um, so you can use the hand raise function and that will let us know that you have a question and we'll stop when we can and address the question. We are going to send you a link at the end to do a sign in sheet. We're going to send you a link at the end to do a sign in sheet. Unknown participant is now joining. Um, and if you can't access that link or you have trouble with that, again, just send us an email. And we'll get you registered. Um, and again, we will stick around after the meeting to answer your questions and we will monitor the chat and the team this week and really all semester. So as soon as Natalie puts us in presentation mode, we will begin presenting our topic. Do you not see my screen, Allegra, right now? I do see your screen, but it's not in presentation mode. Well, so I'm sharing my desktop, so those videos will come up. So is that okay? Is it? It's full oh, screen. Yeah, you yeah. just see the little box. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. So I, uh, we're going to introduce ourselves. I'm Allegra Davis Hanna. I teach English for the Connect campus. I've worked for Connect since we began in 2014. I'm mm -hmm. also the department chair for English and Humanities. Uh, I'm Austin Haynes. I'm an instructional designer on the Connect campus. Uh, I've been there for three years, and I, I'll, I'll monitor the chat for questions too, like so. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And Hello. I'm Natalie Russell, and I teach biology at Connect campus. I've been at Connect for three years, and I'm also the department chair of sciences, so I'm ready to get started. And it says to let everybody know I'm recording this, so I am recording this one, Allegra, just so you know. In case we want to post this one. Great. So Natalie, can you walk us through Menti while I figure out where that background noise is coming from? Maybe the background noise is Natalie. I think no, I got I just, it. I, I was I muted. I, I was muted. But one of the things we wanted to do to start our session is to ask you to think about if you're used to teaching face to face or if in you know the past you've taught face to face, what kinds of things do you talk with your students about or do you have discussions about that aren't just lecturing. So um, if we want to try out this tool so that you can see how it works, you might want to use it in one of your online classes or even in a face to face class. So we want you to be participating and let us know some of your thoughts about um, how you what you tell your students besides just lecture. So if you would on your phone or another device, if you have one, um, unless you you want to just open a new window in your browser, if you would go to menti.com and then when you do that, the first thing you should see is it asks you for a code. And if you would just enter 519342, then there will just be one question that it's asking you, which is what else do you tell or show your students in a face to face class? Because um, we just want to think about those things as we go through our discussion tonight. So. Um, Allegra, if you we can wait or if you want to do the next slide, then we can come back. It's up to you. Yeah, let's go. Let's go forward and then come back. All right. It's like a two step. Gotcha. 
So today we're going to really focus obviously on videos to use in online teaching. We're going to talk about things to avoid and things to remember just generally, and then we're going to talk about some specific kinds of videos. There will be a lot of links here, um, and those links are going to uh, sample videos. So some of our instructors have posted a lot of uh, videos in the past few semesters, and we have samples. We're going to show you a few minutes of those samples, but um, you will have access to all of those links um, after the session, so you can go in and watch all of the videos um, and to the full extent, but we're not going to show you all of the videos because we'd be here for six hours. Natalie, what are you doing to the screen? Uh, I'm not doing anything to the screen. Is it doing something weird? Yes. Did Austin take over? Someone sure did. It wasn't me. Okay, let, let me reshare my screen. It's okay. Okay, give me a second here. Now we should be back. Okay. Are we good? Okay. <laughs> so, um, Let's go back to our mentee poll and see what our results are. Let's do it. All right. So these are the things that you say you do in your class. Um, oh, I like sense of humor. That's great because we're going to talk about that for sure tonight. Um, are there any funny events? people here? I'm here. No, I said funny. <laughs> So several people say current oh, events, <laughs> um, animations, YouTube, video, group collaboration, um, PowerPoints, videos from YouTube, um, how to use software, reminders, pictures of my dogs, favorite books. Okay, so um, and how to do lab activities. So that's a great. Um, I mean, yes, we we talk to students about a lot of things besides just. Um, the lecture for the for the day. Fifty one ninety three forty two. Sorry. Is that a secret code? Yes, that is the secret code to all things. So, put, put the wrong minty code in the chat. I'm sorry. That was me. You're good. So you don't want to. <laughs> you don't need to use a video for everything. Um, and in fact, it's probably a bad idea to try. So think about when videos would be most effective and most appropriate to enhancing what you're doing in your course. So I use videos for lesson introductions, and that's to provide some context and to connect uh, lesson two to what we covered in lesson one. The best thing about lesson introduction videos is it's my opportunity to emphasize to students what's most important for them to get from a lesson. I don't actually have a lot of lecture videos. I mostly have lesson introduction videos. Um, I also introduce myself in an, an instructor introduction video, and I introduce um, my students to the course in a separate way. These are important because even though they don't have instructional content, they help me connect to my students, relate to them as a human, and let them give them a kind of a sense of calm as they begin the semester so they don't um, have as many anxieties and worries about taking an online class. And if I have a unique experience that I can show for students, and this is what a lot of you put, so lab exercises, demonstrating how to do something. If I have the opportunity to interview an expert about something or to demonstrate or model something, or I can show a time or a place that students otherwise couldn't access, I would use a video to create that unique experience for them. Next slide, Natalie. I'm I'm moving forward. Is it not moving no, forward? No, I'm still on when to use video. Hmm. There we go. So some quick things to remember. Um, don't be afraid to show your face. At least now you went too far. Don't be afraid to show your face. Um, will you go back to things to remember? I don't know what's happening. Yeah. 
it thanks to avoids first. Okay, that's insane. fine. I'll start here. Um, so things to avoid. The first is avoid specific dates or things like this thing happened next week or this thing happened this month. That limits the usability of a video to the very semester that you're putting it in. And that's fine. You absolutely can make one time use videos. But if it's about a topic that you cover every semester, you probably don't want to date the video so that you can use it in the future. You also want to avoid violating copyright. So don't use images, text, music um, that is copyrighted. If you want to look for Creative Commons materials to have images, if you want to create your own images, um, but definitely don't plagiarize or violate copyright when you create your video. I will say if you have something in your video that's music or content that is copyrighted, YouTube usually flags it and won't let you share it. They have a lot of AI running that. And uh, don't take this the wrong way, but if your video is very bad, then it misrepresents you and it kind of damages your ethos. Now that doesn't mean it has to be perfect. I don't create perfect videos, uh, but if it is a low quality video, so if students can't hear you, if students can't, uh, if there's a lot of background noise, if um, the, what you're saying doesn't match what's on the screen, then that kind of damages your ethos and it makes students less likely to want to engage in videos in the future. So you might have to take a few tries to get it right, but it's definitely worth it. So things to remember, now we're back to that. <laughs> One is don't be afraid to show your face if you're comfortable showing it. Um, it's totally a good idea for at least a couple of videos during a semester to show your face and let your students know that you're a person and you have a personality and you make facial expressions. It's also fine if you're not comfortable doing that. If you don't want to be on video, you don't have to be. We have plenty of examples of high quality videos where the instructor's face never appears. Definitely ask for help. So the three of us are probably not experts, but we have a lot of experience making videos and we've made a lot of mistakes that we've been able to learn from. You can also just Google how to use video editing software or how to upload things into YouTube. We are here to help you. We'll be here to help you all semester long. And you don't need a professional $100 microphone. You don't need a professional camera. You don't need a fancy studio. We're going to talk about some basics about how to frame yourself and how to light a video, but you don't need to buy anything that you don't already have. So the first kind of video we're going to cover is videos that help you and your students get started in a course. And those are introduction videos. So one kind of video <laughs> is an instructor introduction, and those are very personable. They're not really related to course content. They're the same uh, kinds of things that you would do on the first day of an in-person class when you introduce yourselves and you just give your students a little bit of information about you. We are not asking you to go beyond what you're comfortable sharing. So if you don't want to talk about your family or your children or your personal life, if you don't want to share anything beyond your research interests and what you teach and how long you've worked there, that's OK. Um, I show people pictures of my pets and my husband, and um, I am really funny and have a huge personality. And so I share that with my students, but you have to do what works for you. I will tell you the one way to fail is to be disingenuous. Students always know when you're not being <laughs> yourself in a video. So just do what works for you. Um, you can do it a lot of different ways. You can be on camera, so you can film it with your phone. You can uh, talk over a slideshow of pictures and you can just have uh, do a talk over a PowerPoint and go through a slideshow where you introduce yourself to students. So Natalie's going to play you. Just pick one of these examples. Of course, she picks mine. So I'm not talking on camera. I'm not talking at all, in fact. We can't hear that, Natalie. Well, I think it's my I think that that everyone is um, in the it, my internet. It's just so I don't know that it's enough to get that okay. through. But um, but you can see you saw some of the video, right? And she's narrating the pictures. 
Um, and I'm just going to show you Tanya's. Um, again, you may not be able to hear it. We tested this right before. Um, did you did you click share my audio? I did. OK. And she's talking over the Bitmojis um, for her math class. And again, you'll, we're going to share this presentation with you with all of these links so you can go in and watch all of these videos. Um, not that you have to watch all of them, but you can go in and watch any or all of them that you might find helpful. So yes. those are instructor introduction videos. We are also going to talk about um, course welcome or course introduction videos and those are a little different so those are the same thing that you might post in a first announcement and so that's you prioritizing the most important things from your syllabus and letting students know really how your course is structured and how your course works these videos are important because um, students have are taking multiple classes all online and they all work a little bit differently. So you're going to help walk students through um, how to get started in the course and what to expect. And you're going to, in that video, emphasize the policies that you want to bring attention to. Again, you're doing this in a positive, welcoming way. So you're not shouting at them, read the syllabus, don't ask dumb questions, <laughs> but you are welcoming to the course and you are letting them know what to expect of you and you are letting them know what you expect of them. And so sometimes people combine that, the course welcome and the instructor welcome. I don't because I use the same instructor welcome video every semester for every course, and I change the course welcome video um, every semester. So I have two separate videos, but you'll see that one of our examples is a, an instructor who combines them both. And so she welcomes students to the course and to and introduces herself at the same time. So you can play Samantha's. And so you see hers is a screencast video where she's talking in the bottom corner and it's a voice. I think that's voice over PowerPoint. She probably used uh, Screencastify or Screencast-O-Matic to make that video. And we'll talk about those um, today, later today. But she's got uh, a PowerPoint and her face in the bottom so that she can, you know, introduce herself to her students. She says in that video that she doesn't put her face on every video, but she did it in the first one to get to know them or to let them get to know her. Hey, I hate to do this, but can uh, Natalie, can you re uh, show the, vid the your screen? Start it again. Yes, ma'am, because we got some people who can't see. So I want to see if we can get it to okay. bump out to them. Sorry. Let me, let me try to um, reshare again. saying you're about to join a whiteboard? Does anyone know why that's happening? I do not know why that's happening. All I can see is on my screen it says whiteboard whiteboarding in progress. For now, yeah, only yeah. members of this org can participate. That's the only thing I've seen. I haven't seen one thing you've done yet. Yeah. So who is who it. is writing the word hot like that? Yeah. Somebody turned the whiteboard on. I don't know why. Uh, okay. Can everybody see that now? Is there anybody that can't see that? And if you'll turn your mics on and let us know really quick. Is can, this a yeah, course I can welcome see it. video? Yes. 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 I can see it. Can yes. see it. I can see it. I can see it. Let yes. me try really quick to play and uh, and see if you hear this now that I think maybe somebody was just sharing or something over. Welcome. There we go. <laughs> so um, most of the PowerPoints you will not see me on, but I did want to do this welcome video. Um, that you could see me so you could actually see who your instructor was for the summer. To tell you guys kind of how to start the class, uh, you can see here, um, this is a screenshot actually of like. So yay, the audio is working, correct? Yes. yes, it is absolutely correct. Yay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the next kind of video that you might use to get started in a course is a course walkthrough. And that is exactly what it sounds like. The instructor is screencasting the course, which is open on their screen, and they are showing you what happens when you click here and here and here and how to find 
or how to submit or where to go if you need a particular resource. This is very helpful for intro courses and courses that may be a student's first online course or even a first college course. And again, you're going to use Screencastify, Screencast-O-Matic, or Snagit. Any of those are, are going to give you this functionality. You can also use the Screencast tool in PowerPoint to uh, create a screencast video. So your screen is open to your course and you're basically showing students if you're lost about something and you need research help, Welcome go here. Welcome to Biology 1408 at TCC Connect. So this is the start here page of your course. And there's a list of items to do in order in order to become familiar with the course layout. So first, left menu, okay, the course you still hear the audio? Yeah, somebody's not muted. Now, Allegra, is your English one, does it have audio or is it a... Not should really. I show that? Okay, so that would be an example of how to do it where you're pointing things out and you don't necessarily have to speak. Yes, uh, Mohammed just asked if you have access to this recording. Yes, Mohammed, we're going to send out this PowerPoint and all the links in it are clickable. So you'll be able to click on those links and access all of these videos. And they are on the district's uh, YouTube page. Once you're inside there, you can click around and look at all the content and videos and examples inside there if you'd like. So obviously we're going to want to use a lot of videos for instructional content. So um, those were intro videos. We're going to talk about um, teaching videos now. The first and my favorite personal is uh, a topic overview video. So that means that you are introducing students to a topic and you're getting the basics. Again, it helps you connect the new information to what you've covered in previous lessons or in previous courses and it let students understand what's most important, what to look out for in the rest of the lesson materials, and how the content might connect to their lives or their majors or their interests or future assignments. So you get to do the same thing you would do in the first 10 minutes of a course when you are giving students an overview of what the, what the day's lesson is going to be about. And again, that lets students hear from you, the expert, and uh, it gives you a chance to really focus their attention on what you think is most important. Because if you're assigning them a chapter to read, it's hard for them to understand uh, just implicitly what is the most important thing about the chapter. So your intro will help them with that. And we don't have to show that example because it's it's a pretty basic instructional video, but the example will be there for you if you want to go and look at it. So what most of you are planning to do probably is an instructional video or a lecture capture video. And you can do those using voice over PowerPoint, using Screencastify, Screencast-O-Matic, or Snagit. You can do those using the screen capture function in PowerPoint, or you can uh, set your phone on something and be in a quiet room and record it on your phone. So the best, best thing to do is to limit these to about 10 minutes. 15 is okay, but 10 is really what you're shooting for. Shorter than that, and it's hard for students to understand what's important and to get into the swing of things, and longer than that, and students, I promise you, aren't watching it or aren't listening or aren't able to process all of that information at once. Now, you can post three 15-minute videos in a single lesson, and that's a 45-minute lecture, but breaking it up help students take a break, rest their brains, process information, and it also helps them understand how you would organize it. So if you broke the lesson up into 15 minute chunks, then you're telling them already these ideas go together, these ideas go together, and these ideas go together. And that helps them understand and process the information a lot better than if you give it all to them at one time. We would suggest that you break up longer or we, that you break up videos with activities in between them 
So give them a video and a discussion question, a video and an assignment so that they can apply what they're learning in each video to some kind of application or assessment exercise. And we have literally hundreds, possibly into the thousands now, uh, videos like this on our YouTube channel. The we have curated for you two good examples here. Some of our some of the videos on there are great. Some of the videos on our YouTube channel are two hours long, and so that's obviously not a practice that we're uh, necessarily going to recommend. But um, we have some examples here for you if you um, want to see what a great lecture capture video looks like. And uh, Edpuzzle is a resource you can use to help you chunk material and to combine it with a Blackboard quiz. That can be a graded quiz or an ungraded quiz or just practice like a survey, but it helps students kind of apply what they're learning in the video. And that's what Edpuzzle looks like, right? It's like a little quiz out to the side. I'm going to assume Natalie's saying yes. Uh, and depending on what your subject matter is, you might be doing how to or demo videos. And so those would be you showing your students how to do something in a lab setting or if you're teaching culinary or if you're showing students something that they need to actually do like research or how to find an article. Um, and so how to and demonstration videos are a great opportunity for you to include to combine all of these kinds of um, instructor presence. So you're you have cognitive presence, which is you talking and um, explaining things to students, but you also have social presence because you get to show your personality and how you would approach research or how you would approach baking or how you would approach working in a laboratory. So you get to combine both of those really important aspects of presence in a how-to video and students get to see you model something related to the discipline and we have great cooking videos on our youtube channel from the culinary arts faculty at southeast campus so you can watch them because they're great demonstrations of teaching videos also you can watch them and you can get better at cooking i may have done that Okay. I don't know what where Natalie went. Oh, there it is. Okay. I don't know what's happening. I'm not sure either. But there's that whiteboard again. Uh, someone's gone into I the whiteboard. Yeah, I think somebody's taken over the sharing. Yeah. Let me let me open my sharing again. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to go back in and, and, and supersede them in sharing. Yes. There so here we go. Yeah. Somebody's trying to take over our presentation here. We're being bombed. <laughs> I this is Carmen Bowman and I have had a student take over my presentation. It's very weird. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how they do it. Earlier today, they were able to close it off. There was an icon on the screen that said uh, take take it take over or close takeover or some uh, with a line through it. So um, there are a couple strategies when it comes to how to make videos that maybe the easiest is voice over PowerPoint. And the. <sighs> If I mute you, Natalie, it's because I can hear myself echoing and that means everyone else can. Um, so there are instructional videos. Oh my God, I sound like a robot. Is that really what I sound like? Okay, there are a bunch of instructional videos that Austin has made um, about how to do this. So I'm not gonna go super in depth because these links right here will take you, step you through the process. But basically you can 
start a PowerPoint presentation on your own computer and record yourself talking through the PowerPoint. It's important to speak clearly, not too quickly, and to not talk during slide transitions because it is not recording audio for that half a second or whatever it takes for you to transition from one slide to another. And once you watch a couple of the demos, you'll you'll really get a good feeling for what is the best practice for that and what isn't. Um, Jennifer Heth has uploaded dozens of these videos where she's doing voiceover PowerPoint, which is great. They're all about 10 minutes long. It again, chunks the content. You can tell students what the focus of each uh, PowerPoint video is going to be. If you save the video file as the .mp4, which that information is in these links that Austin's providing to you, um, you can upload it to YouTube and embed it in your course without taking up any storage space. What I would recommend if you're going to do a voiceover PowerPoint is to share the video and also to share the PowerPoint. So if students want to go through it on their own or alongside you, they can do that as well. So I just want to add one thing, um, Allegra. Now, one thing I like to do, and I don't usually use PowerPoint, I usually use Screencast-O-Matic and OneNote or something else because I like to draw or, you know, point while I'm doing that. But now PowerPoint has the option that you can turn on the pin. So, you know, if you wanted to um, circle something, you know, point something, especially if you're doing something where you have a diagram, then even PowerPoint has that option now to, to make those notations. And, and the one thing I want to add here is uh, the video we launched earlier where the, the live video of the instructor was down in the corner. People tend to think that that's a viable and a, an important option. That's actually, you don't need that at all. And so sometimes people will get, you know, egocentric or don't want their video of themselves online. That's actually good. If you're focused on the content like we're focused here, you don't need to see me or Allegra or Natalie's face. We just want you to focus on the content. It's the same thing when you're doing this for your students. So. Showing your face in your welcome videos and, and other videos are OK, but when you're doing a content video, uh, no offense, but the students don't need to see you. And that's just something that you might want to keep in mind. Thanks. OK. We're on the very wrong way, wrong slide. I think you, yeah, go forward one more. Is this it? Is advice no, for making one. videos? Next one. Nope, one more. Oh no, that's it. That's it. I'm sorry. Uh -oh. I'm sorry. It looks okay. like the, it okay. looks like the other one. I use the same design. <laughs> so again, do do what works for you. Um, if you don't want to make videos, you can make audio files. My students use audio files all the time. That's what I have. Way more audio files in my course than I have video files. Um, Start small again with a short video where you talk over a slideshow. Don't don't feel like you have to do all of this at once. You absolutely do not have to do all of this at once. Um, you'll notice that when we're giving live presentations, we sometimes mess things up or we say, um, and you're still getting the content and you're still understanding what we're saying. So please don't think that you have to be perfect. You don't have to start over if you mispronounce a word. You will get better as you go, and you will also get more used to hearing the sound of your own voice on a recording, and eventually you'll be kind of immune to it. At first, you'll be like, oh my god, I sound awful. Um, it's important to be excited and to share your expertise with students, to be pleasant and to be excited and engaging, and to, even if you're not showing your face on video, to make facial expressions so that students can hear that enthusiasm in your voice. But again, if it's hard to hear you, if it's overwhelming, if you say um, 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 every other word, that doesn't mean never make another video. It just means get a little bit more practice before you share a video. And I just want to assure you that nobody, absolutely no one on earth is going to watch your 50 minute lecture video at one time. So it's it's a much better idea to break those up into shorter videos so that you can help students make it a little bit more meaningful. And I'm going to add a comment to that. So 
you if you have your own YouTube channel, you can go in and see what's the average length of time that a student is watching a particular video. And even if you make a 12 minute video, the majority of them are not making it through the full 12 minutes. So especially if you make a 50 minute video, I mean, so it's just so much better to do them in short chunks. So you do not need a professional studio, but you do need even lighting. So open your blinds or turn on a light. Uh, don't be backlit. So you want lighting to come from in front of you and not from behind you. And if you have weird shadows and you look like a creepy ghost, then change the way that you're lit so you don't look like you're telling the tales from the crypt. Uh, if you're using a microphone, even if you're using a headset microphone like the one I'm using to talk to you right now, just make sure that you stay in even distance. So if you get far away and close up and far away and close up, someone's using the whiteboard again, then um, And Allegra, can you move your uh, little uh, window me. down there out it's, of the way? It's Natalie. That's, that's me. That's me. Oh, sorry. That's me. It's all sorry. good now. Um, what, whoops, don't, what? don't touch your microphone ever for any reason. Um, I promise you that too loud is worse than too quiet. Students can turn it up, but if you are too loud, then you sound really bad. Um, and do a sound test. Record a 12 second, a 10 second video where you're talking. You read the first sentence, look at it, make sure the lighting is okay, make sure that people can, that you can hear yourself and that you don't sound like your, the microphone is inside of your mouth. Um, and then go move forward. Again, it doesn't, the equipment on your phone or your computer or a headset microphone is pretty good. You don't need anything more sophisticated than that. You just need to make sure that you're not touching it and staying a pretty even distance from it. So when it's time to record, remember to be enthusiastic, even if it's 7 p.m. and you've been doing presentations since 9 a.m., you hear that we are still enthusiastic and welcome and happy to talk to you. If, you're, if your face is on the screen, look at the camera lens. Don't look at your computer monitor. Um, and it's absolutely fine, even though you are not talking to anyone. <sighs> To give thinking time to ask a question and to give students an opportunity to think about it. Uh, we recommend that you read from a script. Students can tell that you are um, not sure what your next point is going to be. Um, use your personality. If you're funny, be funny. If you're not funny, please don't try to be funny. Uh, if it doesn't make people laugh in person, it's not going to make people laugh on your video. And you can definitely ask questions, even though no one is going to answer them except your dog or cat. Make sure that you have captions or a transcript. Again, this is much easier if you are reading from a script. If you upload something to YouTube, it will be auto captioned. And if you are speaking at a normal speed and without a lot of background noise, Added, the auto captions are between 80 and 95% accurate. We also don't recommend that you use on screen charts or diagrams that you're not describing so that students who can't see the video can still understand what you're talking about. So, um, if you make an announcement video, uh, these are really fun and we recommend that you use them anytime um, you have something quick to share with students that you want to make a little bit more engaging. These are way less formal than lecture videos and these are an opportunity for you to connect with students and to make sure students are on the same page as you. So if you just wanna do like a frequently asked questions for an upcoming assignment, if something happened in the news that's related to your content area, if you just want to give students a little encouragement before a major paper is due, if you want to say, hey, you guys did great on that last discussion board, here are some things I noticed came up in the discussion a lot, here's my response to that, you can post a quick video like that in the announcements 
And that way you get to kind of connect to your students. And we have a lot of retention information that shows that when students feel connected to you and the course, it improves their outcomes. And if you have the opportunity to interview other people or other faculty members, either in your subject area or another, it's a great opportunity for students to hear two people have an academic conversation, even better if they don't necessarily agree on everything and you can have a respectful academic discourse about a subject. You can, again, these can be video or audio, they can be podcast episodes if you want to record them that way. And we have some good examples of that as well. This is a great opportunity for students to kind of you for you to model for students uh, what that kind of conversation looks like. So how to listen actively, how to engage with someone, how to answer and ask good questions. So we want to remind you of a few things before we move on to your opportunity to ask us questions. The first is that people learn better when you connect new information to existing knowledge, and that's one reason we love lesson introductions. People learn better when information is presented in segments as opposed to everything all at once. That's why we like to break things into lesson folders. That's why we like to chunk information into shorter videos. People learn better when you use images to illustrate key points. As long as the image adds value, they are helpful to students learning. When your lesson materials only use relevant supporting graphics and simple visuals, so you do not need to have visual overload when you have a lesson. And if you want, we can show you um, some some sample lessons of what it looks like when your materials are really they still look engaging they're still visually appealing but they don't have too much everywhere all at once use arrows highlights or text tools to show structure and signal importance so that could be bolding it could be making titles bigger it could be you know circling things like natalie was showing you doing with the pen function just so students can see how up how information fits together. And people learn better when they can learn things in more than one way. If they have the opportunity to listen and to read something either simultaneously, either or, or one than the other, they tend to learn better. And when your presentations, this might be surprising, but I promise we have research to support it. When your presentations are more conversational and extemporaneous, when they sound less rehearsed and less professional and canned, students will learn better from you. So again, don't think that you have to be perfect. Absolutely be yourself and make it a fun, engaging conversation, even in a video. Those are our references which means we now have time for questions. We have actually 10 whole minutes for questions, which is super exciting. Yay. Perfect timing. So you can type them in the chat if you'd like to, or you can um, unmute yourself and talk if you've got a quick question. So the recording will be available in this chat in about about 10 minutes after the presentation is over. It's just going to pop up and say here's the recording of the session. And it will be it will live in this team. Eventually Austin is going to get all of these recordings into our YouTube channel, but that's going to take some time because he does a lot of videos. So um, for now you can find it in the team. You can Austin, can you edit the video and audio in Screencast-O-Matic before you publish it? I know yeah. you cannot in Snagit. Uh, you can actually in Snagit, believe it or not. Uh, it's a weird little process to edit your video in Snagit, but you can edit video in Snagit. Um, the, but in Screencastify, you can, uh, but if you have the VLC player, you can do a, a simple rudimentary editing in the VLC player. If you're on a Mac, you can do editing in uh, iMovie and uh, you can reach out to me and I'll be glad to do one on one sessions with you to help you with any video editing content uh, needs. Sorry, can you show the list of the video making tools again? 
Uh, and will the PowerPoint be available too? Yes, they will. And uh, Natalie, will you put the the list back up? If you're using Screencast yes, Matic, I will. And and uh, and you're and you're liking that tool, I will say Snagit is a little bit better uh, when you're doing screencast, if you're doing screencast videos. Um, and I put that link in there earlier to a guy that's doing a whole series on screen on uh, uh, Snagit. And it's a it's a great tool and the district does have, they do have a contract with that tool. Like I mentioned that, I forgot that the other day, but you said that we didn't have a contract with them. We actually do. Uh, so uh, screen, uh, Snagit is a really great tool. Screencast-O-Matic is, I think Snagit is a little bit better than Screencast-O-Matic. And, so Snagit uh, is definitely better. Yeah. It um, is. And if I, we have a license for it, then that means you won't have as many limitations. But yes. um, you'll put in a help desk ticket to ask for a Snagit license. You should have it installed on your uh, TCC computer. Uh, it's it's in your if you hit the start menu, it's in a file. It's in a folder called TechSmith. Now that's if you have a TCC laptop. It's, it should be on the image, but um, we have a license. So you put in a help desk ticket and get the Snagit license. We're going to probably max out the licenses, but that just means IT's got to get more. But it is a great tool. And the editing on Snagit is, uh, it's actually in what, what you call in camera. You can pause and, 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 and scrub back just a little bit. Uh, if you need help doing that, I can show you how to do it, but it's actually right there on the slider when you're actually playing your video back, you actually have to um, slide it back and forth. Oh my gosh. Uh, Austin, do you have a recommendation for free video editing program from uploaded video? Uh, well, I will tell you that actually uh, a YouTube's video editor is really good. So you mm -hmm. can actually load your video up into YouTube and edit it using the YouTube video editor. That's the best one. You don't have to load any software on your computer and you edit your video while it's actually inside of YouTube. Um, but also I will uh, tell you that if you need help with that, once again, you can reach out directly to me and we can meet one on one in teams or if y'all want to meet, if y'all want to get together as a group and go through that tool, I'd be glad to go through that tool with you. And uh, as the question was, how about using Collaborate? Collaborate's a great tool for doing lecture capture. You can, uh, mm. one of the things I like, well, one of the things Allegra mentioned, Allegra's not a big fan, but one of the things Allegra mentioned was uh, uh, lecture capture and, 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 and things like that. One of the things we can talk about here is asynchronous versus synchronous. If you go and do a collaborate session of your own, walking through your PowerPoint video and, and collaborates what you're comfortable using with, uh, using, if you just download that video and send it to me, I will upload it to YouTube and send you a hyperlink so you don't have to have that installed. But the reason I would want to do that is so that it does get uh, closed captioned um, it's a good idea to uh, to think about closed captioning on everything you do uh, because that's a, a UDL universal design and learning principle of do it anyways because when you get that student who has a, a need, you'll already be way ahead of it. And also Allegra mentioned earlier uh, about students getting content in different ways. If you have your uh, video on a, a YouTube channel, a student can play that YouTube channel uh, uh, through their phone in their car when they're commuting and they'll be able to listen to their lectures inside of the, their car while they're commuting. And that's a great way to get them to uh, access your content in a way, you know, if you can get a 20 minutes more a day with your student, five days a week, uh, you get quite a bit of class time and quite a good bit of time for them to consider content. And so that's a great way to have that happen. Is there a link for attendance? Oh, uh, I just posted it in the chat. Yeah, uh, Allegra. Okay. That, that form actually it right there. I have a question. This is Elizabeth Scott again. I've had a problem since the beginning, and I guess you didn't get me into the chat, and it didn't work when I tried to go out and go in. Yeah, I saw you coming back in. I it didn't work. You're right. Oh, nothing worked, and I went in. I couldn't when I went to OneDrive. I don't know. I'm not even sure where it took me. But the thing that's so strange is I joined when I was in Outlook. I I had I pulled up the email that had the RSVP and then joined the meeting and that's what I clicked on. So I thought by clicking in that route that that I, that was going to get me where I needed to go. So I'm pretty pretty well confused, but I don't think I, I feel like I'm not linked to anything to, you know, 
uh, your your videos or anything. So, and I and I'm just using my laptop at home. Obviously, I guess most people are. Elizabeth. If, uh -huh. if you would send me an email, this is Natalie. So to, at natalie.russell at oh, tccd. Dot. Let me let me write that down real quick because I, I can't even see okay. you. OK, Natalie Russell. Uh, and it's N-A-T-A-L-I-E and R-U-S-S-E-L-L. You know, okay. at tccd. If you'll email me, then I will make sure to send you links to all of the sessions that you attended, and also by completing those sign-in sheets, then we'll have your e email address. So when we share out all the presentations, we'll make sure that you get that. And I'm not sure um, what's going on with your, you know, because we've added you as a member, so it's something assigned to Teams. It is so it's so very strange because I've never like I said, and I guess probably others that are attending this right now, maybe having the same problem. Um, I just didn't I didn't anticipate that I was going to have a problem because I haven't had one problem with any any uh, faculty meetings or anything. So anyway, I think I think my uh, chat is only working half the time. Last thing I have is from Austin at 702. This has been uh, scattered. I, this is my sixth class today. And at first I was getting a lot of chat during the, the whole hour. And now it's getting less and less. Just, I think it, I don't know it's you. I think it might be our program. It's Teams. Uh, Teams doesn't update chat. I'm also not sure why a person keeps enabling the whiteboard but hopefully you can see my screen um <laughs> and the link uh for attendance is being posted in chat i mean i'm i can repost it but if your chat's not updating then that's probably not going to help you a whole lot i can tell you that the best way to keep up with the chat unfortunately is to open it on your phone for some reason it updates immediately on your phone or your ipad and when you're running it through a desktop client the chat is very slow to upload um i that's a team's issue it's not anything that we can do or even the help desk Hi, excuse me, it's Oksana Nemirovsky, and uh, I have same problem, but will it be possible just uh, maybe to spell the link, what uh, the link no. uh, record the attendance? That's what they did in previous session. So the, you're better off just emailing me or Natalie um, to get us to send you an email of the link. It's about 100 letters and numbers. Beautiful. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I saw, uh, and I might uh, mess mess up the name, so I'm sorry. Nymesha, you said so. Your audio got switched off. You missed the answer to the question about if and when the presented slides will become available. Did yes, that's right. Uh -huh. yeah. We will put them into the team as soon as we're um, as soon as the presentation's over, and they'll stay there along with the recording. And then also, uh, I'm sorry, I had another question about the video. Um, sorry uh, to the interrupt you. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so um, I'm actually new to Teams. Um, how would I be able to access um, uh, the video? Because once I uh, uh, leave the meeting, would I still have access to the chat? Yes. Oh, OK. Yes. And then also you can go to Microsoft Stream, and the uh -huh. video should auto appear in there uh, for everybody who's a member of the team. It should auto appear. Sometimes it's a. Uh, 20 or 30 minutes after this, and somebody had asked that a while ago. Uh, I will download the videos and load them to YouTube and put them on our district YouTube channel uh, for you to look for you to view. But I, I saw that just a second ago. Somebody asked about uh, the video, so I miss, I'm missing your. Oh, we'll get the link to the recording day. Nila Jana, is and, that right? Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks. No problem. But I and you should it. all be when you go to your list of teams. So when you go into teams and you look at all of your teams list, this is the one the little um, icon is a light bulb. So you should all be added. So you should be able to go in that team and see that video once it's posted. 
And then the one thing I would say is if you have a problem with any of that stuff, uh, once we're done with this, just remember me, Allegra, and Natalie's names, and then email us directly, and we can we can definitely help you on an individual basis get access to the materials up to and including the PowerPoint and things like that, because we have direct access to that. And all those links are active in it. Even when Allegra showed that at the end, she had uh, um, Audacity and things like that loaded in there as a hyperlink. So you'd be able to click on those links and go right to those tools um, and, and access those tools. And those are district approved tools that uh, can be utilized to create content for your course. I don't know if this would be a shortcut or not, but I registered for the session through TCC Learn Center, and I've been using the links in there to to get into the session. So um, if there's any follow up or anything, you could post links to the video there or links no. to the too. No. It takes longer to get something in the Learn Center than it would be for me <laughs> to mail it to your house. Right. But I will, I will send you this. Let me send you all this. I'm going to put this in the chat right now, and some of you. If, if you can't see this, like I said, once again, just remember my name, Austin Ames. That's a link to the district's faculty channel there. Um, so you'll be able to access all the videos and you are welcome to use any of those videos. That's the ones that Allegra was talking about earlier where Jennifer Heth has posted a ton of stuff from the history courses and there's government videos and things like that in there. Um, and then this is a link to the district's uh, uh, instructor channel, the Connect instructor channel, channel I'm about to post. And if you'll just click on those and subscribe, uh, you will be able to uh, access any of that content inside there. There's things, there's videos in there and help, help you inside of utilizing tools in Blackboard and information on how to build content out and uh, different subjects like that. So if you need any help with that, once again, please don't fail to reach out. No, Austin, it won't let me subscribe to it. To the channel? Yes, I just press on subscribe. It says you're not allowed to. For the connect, for the learn channel, really? Yeah, we are sorry, but you don't have access to YouTube. Please contact. Are you? You're so you're logged into your my TCC. My TCC Gmails don't let you access YouTube. You just got to log in through to that through your yeah, personal okay. Gmail. Maybe that's the case. Okay. Yeah, that that will be it. Uh, you'll have to log in using if you log in. You if you have a Gmail account. If you'll log into your yeah. Gmail account and then click on that link and subscribe to it, it'll allow you to subscribe. Yeah, I think that's the case. Thank you. You bet. And I don't know if this is just coincidence, but I was having a little trouble with my chat and I just closed it out and opened it again and it that helped. So I don't know if that will help anyone. I mean, not the, didn't close the whole team, just closed the chat window and reopened. Let me see if I can get Edna to change. Edna. Yeah, that was the same with me. This is Olga, and I agree with um, whoever spoke about the chat window. Okay, good. So if you closed yeah. it, good. And I think one thing, too, that we should take away from this is anytime that you're teaching with technology, <laughs> you're going to have some little things that maybe don't go perfect or you learn, you know, how you'll do it differently next time. And, um, you know, uh, we, we live and learn, right? Yeah, I'll Kelly really said she reopened chat about five times before it updated and it did that to me today it, it for some reason it went blank and only had like three of my posts in there for a long time so uh and we do have a lot of people I, i've not been in that many teams meetings with you know 70 plus people so i don't know if that has something to do with it or not hey and, well thank you nicole nicole said thank you for providing the training and for being patient well we've been through this for years so we're kind of used to it we all deal with online stuff all the time. So that's why we want to be available to y'all. And, and I will tell you, I work with, with the faculty. I'm in instructional design and the faculty is very giving. So if y'all have questions, please feel free to reach out to one of us. And if we don't know the answer, we'll make something up or find something valid. We will not make something up, but I will tell you, we the sign-in sheet is, is in the chat. I promise you we are linking it. Um, and when the chat updates, you will find it. You well, are gonna you you are going to be overloaded. So the recordings will be there, and we will stay in that team, and we will monitor it all semester. You're probably not gonna make ten videos in the first week. So when you get to September or October, and you're finally ready to really put a lot of rich content in there, 
um, we're still here to help you. And the other thing to remember is if you're teaching any of the 20 highest enrollment courses, we already have pre-built courses for you and you don't have to build those courses. You can use the courses we have built and just personalize them. We have sessions, again, this is gonna sound like a big promotion for myself, but it's not. We have sessions um, later this week. Uh, I don't know if you can see my schedule or if you still see that bizarre whiteboard, but um, <laughs> if you can see my screen, this is the schedule for the next few days and the peer developed courses sessions um, are about how to access and use those pre-built courses. So if you're teaching Composition 1 or History 1301 or Intro to Government Studies, I don't know what that course is called, <laughs> um, we have the courses built. And um, LaToya, you got to do the opposite. You have to be logged out of TCC Gmail. TCC doesn't let you use YouTube with their Gmail. Um, we also have sessions on testing. This session on instructor presence is really about how to um, be present both intellectually and cognitively, but also socially and personally in your classes and to form those kinds of connections that you're used to having with students in person. Reasonable rigor is about how to um, create course standards, uh, policies, and um, to structure a course so that you are reasonable but also rigorous in a course. And so those sessions I think are gonna answer a lot of the unknowns that you have about online teaching when it comes to how do I uh, maintain, you know, a semblance of control over what's going on or how do I structure something. The testing session will help you build really authentic assessments in a course, um, but it will also help you do things like use Proctorio and upload stuff from a test bank. Um, accessibility questions we have a session for those and we're doing this this week and next week so if you are feeling today like your brain's going to explode take tomorrow off and come back the next day um, and i don't think that you can get credit for going to the same session twice but you're welcome to come to the same session multiple times if you just want to hear it again or if you um, didn't get it all at once. We understand cognitive load has limitations for every human. So um, that's why we're doing these sessions so many times. And random questions and technology issues are going to pop up. And just like Natalie said, we hope that we're modeling for you what you can do in your courses with just go with the flow and stay focused on your objectives and your content and teach your students the best that you can. Um, we are here to, as long as you have questions. So there's still like 50 of you here and that means either I'm really super interesting and amazing and you just wanted to hear me talk more or you have questions. So please um, let us answer. You can get credit even if you're not registered in the Learn Center. That's why we are doing these attendance sheets. And Latoya, you asked, you said you logged into my TCCD. Gmail, use your personal Gmail to log into that to subscribe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, to YouTube. The my TCC email will not do that. Uh, you need to use your personal. So if you have a Gmail account with your that you use for your personal stuff, use that to subscribe, and it will it will allow you to subscribe. Uh, you can also just keep that link uh, on your desktop and uh, click on that. We we load new content on there pretty fre frequently, and the faculty channel is constantly getting uploaded with new content and it's usually we have playlists in there so you can click on the playlist and look so if you teach baking or bionics there's usually some idea <laughs> content on there so just so you know there that's available to you and those resources are available and there are some great lectures in there so you don't have to build your class out from scratch there's sections in there on the civil war and george washington and uh, neurobiology and things like that. So whatever you teach, more than likely, if you go through there, there is faculty content that's been created, uh, usually from textbooks that are district approved. So it may be a benefit for you. And if you need help navigating that, please reach out to me in my personal email, and I'll be glad to go through that with you in a team session one on one. And um, David, I just posted a link to download the course shells. Um, that will give you a cartridge that you can upload into a Blackboard course. We'll cover how to do that in the peer develop courses session. And we'll also show you what they look like and how to personalize them. But um, that link I just sent you will take you to a form where you can download the course cartridge. 
And then again, you just upload that right into your own course. Is it so? Yes, sort of, Carmen. It's legal to read from a text. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you wanted to, so I read quotes all the time in my videos, and that's fine. But um, really, if it's more than a few sentences, you should not be reading it in a video because that's basically the same thing as copying it and, and giving, and yeah, and posting like an illegal you know, not an illegal, but like a bootleg copy of something. Yes, and just, just so you know, uh, whenever they close caption and you post something like that to YouTube, the transcripts from the closed captions are monitored also. There's AI that monitors them and looks for content copyright infringement on books and text and things like that, just so you know. Uh, if you read a ch an entire chapter of a textbook into the uh, uh, YouTube, uh, it will capture that and it can block your content. So that is something to be aware of. Uh, but there are OER textbooks out there where it is legal to do that, just so you know, too. Mm -hmm. So depending on your subject matter, you can yes. go to open, OpenStax, O-P-E-N-S-T-A-X dot com. And there are, are free textbooks in there. And we love for you to use OpenStax textbooks. They're great. Anything that's got a Creative Commons license, and it will say Creative Commons license, that means that you can use it um, in your course for instructional purposes, as long as you're not making money from it. You can use the book, you can read from it, you can make a recording of it, um, you can use the images and their diagrams. So if you're using an OER, absolutely. And so uh, I'm going to share that right quick. I'm going to change this and share that right quick so that everybody can see that. But that's Creative Commons there. It's just creativecommons.org. And if you're looking for free, uh, textbooks or free free assets there's you can search for creative commons images uh there are all kinds of things and it teaches you about how to utilize these materials here uh it's a great resource you'll see them here OpenStax is part of this and so they they all that is on there OpenStax is uh, also a resource you may want to be aware of it's through uh um uh part of part of the organization that works with that is uh rice university in uh, houston and those are all free textbooks and there's all kinds of free uh, assets for uh, course development on there. You can see the subjects it's by subject here and there's technology even to utilize for to plug inside of your course. It's great content. Who has another question? So I have a question. Uh, I don't know anything about Google Class, Google Meetings, yes. and Google Hangout. And I'm assuming those are all would be fine for us to use for TCC. Is that I correct? would not use Google Classroom. OK. Um, because the, for a lot of reasons. Um, but Google Meet, absolutely, you can use to um, do anything that you would do in Teams or collaborate. So you can have live meetings with um, your whole class. You can do one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with individual students. You can have open office hours where students can just pop by and ask questions. You can do exam reviews. You can do all of that in Google Meet. The easiest way to do it, honestly, is to open your TCC Gmail and there's a link over on the left that says meet, start a meeting, join a meeting. Um, and if you want to schedule a meeting, if you want to schedule a meeting in advance, you can do that through your Google Calendar. So I'm going to try and share and it, it with you. And it will do a closed caption also, correct? Yes, it will. It will do the same kind of live captions that um, we have in Teams. Yes. And is that published on uh, YouTube then after that? I don't know if it's published automatically to YouTube, um, but I can't show you my email because it's full of email from students, but there's a link right here in my email that says join or start a meeting. So I can join or start, but if I go to, how do I get to my calendar? It's hard for me to do this without going through my email screen, but again, I can't show that to you. Um, but if I wanted to schedule a meeting for Thursday at 7 a.m., 
I would just need to add Google Meet video conferencing to that meeting. And then I would be able to share it. Oh, that's why. I have too many Google accounts open. That's how many Google accounts I have open. There we go. Google Sites is okay to use, isn't it? Like Latoya is asking that, but Google Sites is okay. I've never tried it, so I don't know. It's well, it's okay to use that if you're comfortable using it, Latoya. It's okay. The district approved Google tools, just so you know. So um, security wise, uh, well, that's a whole other issue. But <laughs> uh, Google takes everything that you do and, and copies that information. But yeah, you're fine. It's the district approved what, those tools. And what is Google Hangout? Um, I don't think it's still a something, is it? Yeah, I actually looked it up a little bit before our meeting to try to figure out, but I couldn't quite understand the difference between the meeting and Hangouts. I think that it's, well, let me verify, but my understanding is that Google Hangout is turned into Google Meet, so let me verify. But um, so that, that actually does kind of ring a bell because it, it sounded like there was a institutional copy or a paid copy that the Google meeting yeah, changed to Google uh, Hangout. Google Google officially turned it into Google Meet. It's that's what it is. The reason they called it Hangout was you could leave it open uh, and, and it, people could just log into it anytime. But it's now Meet. Well, but Hangouts is still sitting here in my Google. So it's still saying messaging, voice, and video calls. So yeah. um, I think it's more like an IM feature than a meeting. But at some point, they're going to have to merge these two tools. But you're right. It's still sitting there as a Google option. And the flip, the flip grid? Yes. So Microsoft actually, isn't does, it? does that have like a very short, limited time that you can do a recording? Uh, I don't think so. No, you can record. You can set it for a short time if you want to give a student. Like, think of it like video Twitter. But you can. They can also uh, post in eight minutes. I'm I'm working on a project right now where we're setting it for ten minutes, uh, and people can put in a ten minute video when they're reading an abstract on their papers. So, mm -hmm. okay, you you can use it longer. Okay. The way I was thinking Thank of it. Google Hangout would be more like doing a FaceTime, and Google Meet would be more like doing a Teams. Google mm -hmm. Meet, you can record it, and then uh, once you end the recording, it turns it into a video, uploads it to the uh, Google Drive associated with that account, and then you could share it. So if you're doing a class, you could uh, make it a shareable link that students could go back and look at later. Yes, it was an open, it was open resource. It was almost like video texting. And that, that was what their original intent was. It. They just are shutting down the engine on that part of it. So it's going to transition over to Google Meets, it says, in the next year and a half to two years. Is what oh, they're... so the other difference is that Google Meet is only available if you have an enterprise account, which we do. Um, so if you're just using a random Gmail, you may not have Google Meet. But um, I'm going to post a link to how to record who can record and what's being recorded in Google Meet if you have um, interest in doing that. Um, if you wanna do like your class meetings or your um, office hours using Google Meet, I just posted a link that's kind of a primer to uh, get started with it. Yeah, I'm actually kind of considering doing all my uh, lectures and my video and PowerPoints and discussions on Google Meet, I think, Personally, I think I have to make a decision really soon of which platform and stick with it, whether it's a good decision yep. or not, because the students, I can't say, well, that didn't work out very well. Let's go. You know, I can't have 14 weeks in our appreciation of not having a, a comfortable uh, format for all of us. Yeah, so I would, I, I mean, I don't work for Google, um, but I would say it's the easiest for students to adapt to because they already know how to access their Gmail and they already have basic functionality, fam familiarity with Google. The other thing is it's you can record Google meetings, but students can't. 
And once it's recorded, it goes into your Google Drive and then you can just choose to share it with a link or choose not to share it with a link. But but if you share it... Unknown participant is now exiting. If you share it, students can watch it until you delete it. So if you don't want to leave it there forever, um, students will have access to it. And then at the, like at the end of the semester, if you wanted to, you could delete it. Um, and so it's not taking up all the space in your Google Drive and it's not there forever. Um, and you can email it to your students or you can post a link in an announcement. But um, I typically hate Google, but this is super easy to use. And it's also easy for students to find. And if you use it for for live meetings, but you also use it for office hours. I think students are kind of um, more likely to use it because they're familiar with it. Thank you. Yeah, that's my vote, but you're right. You just have to basically pick one and stick with it. I'm not too crazy about Google either. The Google Slides, I just thought was pretty clunky. Collaborate is extremely primitive and I, I don't know. I just uh, have faith. We're getting new tools. <laughs> Won't be anytime soon, but in the I next promise. year. Yeah, oh, we are oh, getting new tools. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know what it will be, but we are getting something new. Yes, oh. Mona, you can upload a Google Meet video into YouTube. It yes. doesn't go up automatically, but you can do it. Yes. And it'll you close can... caption once it's loaded in there. Yep. It closed captions right away when you record, doesn't it? Yeah, it's it's actually running a little slow right now because it's just oh, the engine is actually overwhelmed. They're finding out that the AI is overwhelmed, so it can take a couple of hours for it to close caption. But uh, it does automatically close caption. You just need to make sure that the video is listed as public for at least 24 hours. If you no, list no, no, you're talking about YouTube. He's talking about Google Meet. Yes, you can do auto captions in Google. Oh, Meet. sorry, sorry. Yeah, but yes, YouTube auto captions are going a little bit slow right now. But yes. Yeah. And yeah, so you can not, auto caption a meeting. And they they are uh, their computer, their server is going to be the one that uh, converts us or renders it. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Because okay. I think that's the problem with uh, I'm getting a little confused now. I think Collaborate and um, PowerPoint. I have not been successful of creating a uh, saving it. it it renders all night long and then still doesn't and i am not the only one that has had that same problem hmm. are you talking about collaborate is that what you said the rendering yeah, collaborate and powerpoint you know there was so, on blackboard there was how to turn your uh your um powerpoint into a video so on on collaborate one thing that i i realized because I do some live sessions there. If you don't turn off the recording, like if you just close out before you've said stop recording, it does something that it takes a really long time. Um, I don't know if that might be what's happening, but that happened to me several times. And then I realized if I just remember to say stop recording, I don't get that problem. Okay. I'll, I guess I'll try to give that a try. I'll test it out. Or just never use Blackboard Collaborate again. Well, the that's tools actually, that are coming, though, I promise you, are a lot better. They're, uh, that's an older tool, and it's the video processor on it is ancient in regards to technology. We're looking at new video. Like you, no joke, if all things go, and I hate to say this because I'm sure as I say this, it's not going to happen, but I'm 98% sure that pretty soon we will have our own YouTube channel that's designated for educators to record their own lectures, meet with students, and uh, closed captioning will be included on that, and it will include tools with the with it that allow you to embed questions in the videos and things like that. So yeah, that's, uh, that's where all the students go to. That's where we should be at now. Yeah, and it keeps it uh, keeps our information. We talk about right Google, there. but that's not where they're hanging out. They're hanging out at YouTube. Yeah, it's a uh, there's a whole thing with YouTube that's uh, good, but also not great. The other thing I discovered was on the video. Our students, like uh, I had an autistic uh, girl that was speeding the video up. She says, I understand it better. After yes. I started doing some research about this, guess mm -hmm. what? A lot of our students are doing this, whether they're autistic or not. Yes. Speeding, they're speeding you up. Faster. That seems yes. to be uh, not very well known. Yes. Yes. Accelerating content is a pretty standard practice for younger people now. Oh, okay. yeah. 
I'm gonna have to try that. I'm, I'm getting older. I'm, I think I better try that out. I mean, I have much <laughs> longer to live. <laughs> <laughs> Get all in. You can't. Right? That's right. <laughs> Out of bullet things like that. Uh, but yeah, you can. That's a pretty standard practice anymore. Uh, and, uh, and, and Carmen, you're asking me to do that. I, if you'll send me a picture, I'm way behind on that. Allegra, I have one for Allegra, but I, I'm not done with it. The Allegra will tell you I'm just behind. But uh, if you send me a picture, yeah, I, I, I'd be happy to do that eventually. Yes, I, eventually, but like Allegra sent me pictures to Photoshop, and I haven't even downloaded those pictures yet. Allegra, I'm sorry. So. <laughs> So I'm going to make a plug really quick and, and I've gotten several emails from you guys and I'm sending you out the link. So remember it's Natalie dot Russell N A T A L I E dot R U S S E L L at T C C D dot E D U. If you need to email me about something, but I'm also going to make a plug for, um, I know some of you are here tonight because you can only do evening sessions. And so, um, Austin won't be back with us unless he wants to, but Allegra and I will be back with another colleague, Misty Wilson Mertens, to do a session on reasonable rigor tomorrow night. So we'll talk about um, things that you can do in your online course that maybe you don't have the flexibility to do in a face to face course. Uh, and if y'all need me to come to that one tomorrow, I would actually I'd like to come because. I don't even know what y'all are teaching in that one. So uh, it'd be great to. Um, so this is Kelly Willing still here? OK, so the subtitle <laughs> for that um, session is don't be a jerk. Yes. OK, good, good. Well, then I, a, that, yeah. I can. Yeah, rigorous, rigorous content and just being overly. Harsh and mean. OK, cool. Yeah, actually, I would like to hear that. I know one. you like to be harsh and mean, Austin. So I do. Maybe you should come I can, back. I can be curt. Uh, <laughs> Whatever. I can be very curt. Uh, but yes, I would like to. I mean, I'll, I'll come and listen. I'd like to hear what you're going to teach. Uh, and so I, I, I can say that I think that's awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Sorry about the technical issues. And for those of you who Hold continue on, to Natalie, have, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like you're trying to get rid of them. And it's okay if you have to go because I know that you have um, children. But if you're still here because you have questions, Austin and I don't have lives at all. So we'll stay and answer them. Well, my <laughs> children are 17 and 15, so I think they're okay. I just wanted to give people permission if they, you know, you want to get oh, out yeah. hanging around. If you yeah. if you are just hanging out until we dismiss you because you're a good person, you're totally fine to leave. <laughs> but if you're hanging out because you have a question, we're here to help you. Yes. And I do feel really badly for those of you who are having issues with getting into the team in the chat. So, I mean, I I don't know about you guys, but I recommend maybe submitting a help desk ticket, especially those of you who are having trouble logging in and you're in your Outlook and you're going directly from there, um, because we verified that we've added y'all to the team. So I'm hopeful that they can figure that out before your next session. Hey, look, somebody called me funny. <laughs> you're funny. Yeah, I think you're funny. Yeah. <laughs> but it, all of this stuff I will tell you is uh it's it's like drinking from a fire hose right now. And when you get chance to slow your brain down and talk and think about what we've talked about tonight, uh if you think of a specific thing, and I will say a while ago, and I can't remember it was a David who was saying pick a tool and use it, be consistent throughout the semester. Mm -hmm. I would say the same thing about building video content. Uh uh, there's there's a way to do a welcome video with not having to use your camera at all and I'm a big proponent of that and if you do that and you feel comfortable with that you can build content that same way and this may be the semester that you're doing this the one thing I would say about all of this that's you know COVID has done is uh, these tools that you are learning now uh, um, you're going to carry them back to your face-to-face -face class it is going to be structured like what you've heard for years when they're talking about flipping the classroom these skills that you're learning now are not wasted after you go back to the class. I think that they're going to enhance your ability to engage your students and keep a kind of a constant conversation going with them throughout the semester. And so I would think that uh, anything that you learn here, uh, you know, PowerPoint gets bad mouth, bad mouth by people from time to time. I love PowerPoint. I think it's a great tool for capturing. Ma'am, 
PowerPoint has the craziest features. Like you don't even know how many things PowerPoint can do. It but it, I mean, it, you can make a screencasting video that never even shows PowerPoint. Yes, exactly. In PowerPoint and turn it into an MP4 video, which can be uploaded directly into YouTube. So you don't even need to use Screencast-O-Matic anymore. That's exactly right. Why did and they even? I mean, that's a huge functionality they just added to PowerPoint. Right before we, right before COVID happened, uh, PowerPoint got a major upgrade. And some people don't have it available on their desktops at home yet, uh, but if the district can push it out to you, you can call IT and you can get them to push that uh, upgrade out to you. It's a great upgrade and it does allow you to do uh, quite a bit um, that feeds right into all of your needs as far as presenting information and also doing putting your personality in the course. Like I said, Allegra's, you, when, you, when you get the presentation, you click on it, Allegra, has all still images in her welcome video, but her personality comes through just in the audio. And so uh, that's a big uh, uh, um, asset for you whenever you're building content for your courses. And so, uh, like I said, I don't think any of this is wasted. When you go back to Canvas, campus, excuse me, all of the <laughs> campus, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a psychological slip there. But when you go back to campus, I, I, I would be interested to see how often people are using copiers anymore and handing work out to their students because those skills are going to be carried through. People are going to use uh, the LMS more and more to distribute uh, um, assets to the students. I think that the days of printing are going to go by the wayside to a great extent because students don't really want printed materials much anymore. And if they do, they can print them off of the LMS. So these hey, skills. Austin, are um, someone has a question and they don't want to interrupt you, but I'm Sorry. going to. Mona, what's your question? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, hey, Austin, um, I'd like to check with you. You know, uh, are we going to renew the Blackboard license or are we going to move to a different learning uh, or LMS? We are yeah. moving to a new LMS, one I can almost 100% guarantee. Yes. Is that it going to be a canvas? We don't know. Okay. The reason is because uh, last this last semester, a large chunk of my time went in to create modules. And today in one of the uh, sessions I attended, they said, you know, stay away from modules. So I created all the modules, had the module page. It was nicely laid out. And I, I am not sure, you know, because I'm in the process of designing another course. So I'm going to stick with the content folder as it, I was advised. But uh, how much input should I put? That's my question, because if we are moving to new elements, you know, then that uh, everything down that I do right now will go down the drain. It won't go down the drain. So <laughs> there. So when we get a new LMS, um, we would only ever move to an LMS that would help us with course conversion and would be compliant with common course cartridge, which means we would mm -hmm. never move to an LMS that could not accept a Blackboard course and modify it and be uploaded into the new system. Now, you will have to take some time to fix the way things look and maybe reorder things and not everything gets converted perfectly, kind of like when you put a Word document in PowerPoint or vice versa. Sometimes the little things have to be adjusted, but it won't all go down the drain. My best advice to you, honestly, is if you're gonna make a presentation or a, or a lesson to put, make it in PowerPoint or make it in a video or make it in a Word document, and put that into the LMS, students can open it, read it and use it. But when you convert your course to a new LMS, it's just gonna copy those files. So you don't have to reformat text. You don't have to rearrange objects. It's all in a bunch of external documents anyway. So um, the more you build in Microsoft products like Word and PowerPoint, um, I don't know why you'd ever use Excel for that. The easier it will be, to convert your course and the less you'll have to change. But um, even things like announcements will get converted and put into the new course. OK, and uh, uh, I, I did see that uh, like uh, you were recommending using the Google Meet. Now, when we are using the Google Meet, you know, uh, uh, can we use the Google Docs like the PowerPoints on that, like OneDrive or something like that? But and will it have all the functionalities that uh, the Microsoft Word provides? So Google Docs does have a similar, I don't know if it's identical functionality, 
and anything that you create in Google Docs can be saved as a Word document. Um, but most of what I create in terms of lesson content is actually a Google Doc that I've then linked to. And that way, if I change it, I don't have to re-upload something. So if I just post in my Blackboard, I'll show it to you. If I post in my Blackboard course um, a lesson introduction, then I just actually post it as a link to a Google Doc. And then if in six months I want to change it, I can do all the changes in the document. I don't have to re-upload anything. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Just what our like a random one looks like. Let me share my screen. So right, it's a lesson introduction. Mm -hmm. And I say click this link to access the module introduction. And then they open it to a Word document. And that's the content. That's what their lesson looks like. And if they want to, they can also listen to me read it and they just push play and they can listen to me reading it. Um, so if they want to listen and read or do one or the other, they can. So that way, if we ever do a course conversion, I don't have to change this, but this is in four courses. And if I realize, oh, I spelled that wrong, I change it once, it changes everywhere. Okay, so that means you have all the materials that you uh, share in your OneDrive, like the Google Drive. Yeah, in my Google Drive, yep. Okay, okay, so that's what I would like to kind of do, you know, rather than individually uploading uh, or creating the modules, then probably I'll, in the content folder, I'll provide the link so that students can do that. Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks for sharing that tip. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's pretty much it, you know, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Good, great. Any other questions? It can be it can be about videos or it could just be about class building and course building in, in general because Allegra and Natalie are here and they can definitely help you with anything like that. I can help some. <laughs> you can help a lot. <laughs> Thank you, but uh, I think y'all are y'all are much better at that than I am. So, I'm guessing some people maybe walked off, and some people are just listening for the great conversation. Um, and we'll give it a minute in case somebody's in the process of unmuting and asking a question. But otherwise, we just hope that you come to the rest of the sessions and that we can help you. And if nothing else, that we've made you feel comfortable enough with us for you to reach out and ask questions when you have them. Yes, please do. We're always here to help. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll see. I guess I'll be. I think I've enrolled in the uh, rigors for tomorrow night. And you're right, teaching. Fun. You're teaching art appreciation, John. Did I hear you right? I'm teaching art appreciation drawing one. Drawing two, drawing, uh, painting one and painting two. Painting okay. one and painting two are taught at the same time. Drawing one and drawing two are taught at the same time. Uh, art appreciation, um, in some ways, I'm less worried about it than I am with my visual arts uh, classes. Yeah, studio courses can get weird, but I will say your cell phone is a great tool for that. I'm sure you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I've taught, I've, I've taught, I, that's my background is art, and I've taught uh, studio courses and used online environment to teach grad levels painting courses, just so you hey, know. Hey, I so. know I'm, I'm not an art teacher, but I will say if you need to show your students what it looks like when you draw or paint something, then um, I can send you a link for, so I bought something on Amazon. It like clamps to my desk. It has a cell phone mount on it and a light so that you can mount your cell phone above your desk and light what you're doing underneath it. And then you can be drawing, painting, writing, whatever, and right. recording a video of it. So Would that be? like a uh, email? Yes, just like that, but but for your phone. Right, right. I will yeah, send you. I, a I, um, I've been watching a lot of uh, videos on how to set up the studio to uh, teach these classes, 
And, uh, you know, originally I thought that I would be at the easel with the camera above me, and then I'd have another camera pointed down at the palette. Well, it turns out that uh, having a camera behind you, your arm's going to be in the way of the drawing or the painting all the time. Yeah. So there was a, from a Rhode Island uh, School of Design and Art, uh, the, uh, there's a teacher that's running a really good um, blog, uh, instructional uh, she streams and all that. Anyways, um, she's sitting down and, you know, it's kind of a terrible way to draw or paint because you're not going to stand yeah. back and actually see what you're, you're doing. But I think for the sake of communicating what I need to communicate to the student, it probably is best to, uh, have the camera mounted above. So, but it'll have to be higher up than just, uh, you know, on the desk, to be quite honest. It'll have to be able to, in fact, last semester, I had my, uh, I had, my students could contact me 24 hours, seven days. A week. And uh, if they contact me in the middle of the night, I would get up. And if they had a sketchbook or they were working on their drawing, uh, they would text it to me. I would print it out. And then I had two, Shiner box, uh, Shiner box, uh, boxes, cases, where I had two pieces of wood and my iPad going across it, where I could uh, take out a red pencil and correct their their drawing in real time for them, and that worked out really well. So really, what I'm talking about is kind of what you are suggesting uh, with the hardware to hold your your iPhone, but I just have to get it up a quite a bit higher than uh, probably that device allows. That makes sense? Yes. And if you use Procreate? I, uh, I use them in my class all the time to, uh, as video. I'm always, uh, I show a lot of uh, stuff that's inspirational to me. I show a lot of instructional things. Uh, I will give a lesson and then I'll bring in something like Procreate that's basically uh, just reinstating what I've already said like two or three days ago. Yeah. And it's just okay. another voice and maybe a little different fashion. And then all of a sudden, you know, it starts uh, sinking in hopefully. And have you looked at the, uh, and one of the things that say since you're teaching painting, have you yes. seen the Museum of Modern Art series that they have that artist that can emulate any of the master painters and they do a series like how to paint like Rembrandt. They do a really good job. If you're not familiar with that, uh, uh, it's MoMA that does it. Um, and they do a really good job on those videos. And there's a couple of other people online I would point you to who just paint and uh, um, how, uh, and they have how to, how to videos on there. Yeah, there was uh, a guy that uh, apparently he was uh, a forger and got caught. And now he's giving yeah. lessons on how to paint like Rembrandt and so forth. It's pretty yeah, awesome. Yeah. So I don't know so if it's you, the same one that MoMA bought or not. It may be. No, it's not. Uh, the guy you're talking about is that guy from uh, that documentary on. Uh, and I'm going to post the video now uh, so you can click on this link and this will take you to it. He does. They do a really good job because he talks a lot about, you know, the testicity of paint and the, the, the viscosity of paint and stuff like that. So it does a good job for students and there's a whole series of the one I just sent you is how to paint like Willem de Kooning and so uh, they're really good I will just tell you that they're a great resource okay uh, you are seriously nerding out over here Austin I do I love I can talk I can talk painting all night long just seeing them I can talk painting all night long we can we can go all night long on that no 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 I'm not commenting on that I'm getting a little hungry I'm not gonna lie it's, okay, it's, it's, so we're going to let Natalie eat before we get any hangry biology instructors. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. We'll, we can leave the art nerds to art nerd out, but um, anybody else who has a question, please just email us. Um, I'm going to go make sure that my family's still alive. They've been quiet for a long time, and that's frightening. All right. Yeah. Well, well, and your dog. Thanks, guys. Thanks, I appreciate all your time, and I will see you uh tomorrow and probably in the for the next week or so okay great I I said, so. please Thanks please feel joining. free to reach out okay thank Good you night. Thanks. Night. Night. i'll take care you too